All right, thank you, Dr. Bax, and thank you all for coming. Wow, this is crazy. Um, but as he mentioned, I will be presenting on the influences on material culture, Catherine de' Medici in the art of political and social display. <clears throat> So infamously nicknamed the Black Queen and Madame La Serpente, Catherine de' Medici developed a reputation born of rumor and intrigue at the French court, which featured many women like Catherine that utilized forms of material display to emphasize and legitimize their power and authority. Now this term authority was utilized by Catherine herself within her letters and indicated a right to govern as well as an enjoyment of that right within social and political spheres of influence. Florentine by birth, Catherine's participation at the French court was consistently informed by her background and enabled her to secure her dynastic power through her use of display. This display or performativity that she used manifested itself in the surviving material culture of the time. Based on this, I argue that this surviving material, be it either orchestrated by her or material that was influenced by her directly or indirectly, shows signs of her Florentine upbringing and a Medici consciousness. <clears throat> Caterina Maria Romula de' Medici was born into the infamous Medici family at the height of their power on April 13, 1519, to parents Duke Lorenzo II de' Medici, Duke of Rubino, and Madeleine de la Tour Dauphin. The legacy of the Medici, just to give you a little bit more background, officially began with Cosimo di Giovanni de' Medici in 1434, who used the family status and wealth as wool merchants and bankers during the rise of Florence to subtly influence and rule the city-state from behind the scenes during the 15th century. This man was so beloved and contributed so greatly to the formation of his city that he was given the name Pater Patriae, or Father of His Country. Following the Pazzi conspiracy on the 26th of April, 1478, Lorenzo di Piero de' Medici, Catherine's great-grandfather, asserted his official power as de facto ruler and cultural patron of the city. As such, as you can tell, she was born into a long line of cultural patrons and political leaders, including French nobility. But as she was raised in Florence uh, until 1530, when her uncle, Pope Clement VII, brought her to Rome, Catherine would be highly conscious of Medici aspirations as well as cultural display. This she would then have carried with her when she married Henry II of France, then Duc de Orléans, uh, three years later at the age of 14. But it is her nature, the nature of her upbringing is why I argue that Catherine's Medician identity, formed by her Florentine upbringing and heritage, subtly influenced her cultural and political display at the French court, as seen in the surviving written and visual sources of the time. Through my examination of Catherine's dress politics at her wedding, um, instances of festival or heightened court practice, and through her mourning practices, I will demonstrate the inferred connections between Catherine's Italian past and her French present. So some display of the rhetoric. Historians have focused on Catherine's epistemology or letters, the content of which serves to illustrate the close attention that Catherine paid to public display. Catherine's letters describe her, her consistent ties to her family in Florence, as well as her extensive gift-giving practices, which show her intentionality when constructing and distributing material culture. Through her marriage, Catherine was tasked with maintaining familial and cultural ties in her new court of residence, as women at the time who were in her position were expected to represent, according to Susan Brumhall, and I quote, their dynasties of origin visually and politically, as well as through material gift exchanges and particularly through correspondence, end quote. Brumhall states that Catherine's letters before her widowhood show the clear development of Catherine's Medici identity in France, showing her continued connections to Italian social circles. One example, a letter from Catherine to Maria Salviati demonstrates this relationship and Catherine's early awareness of political ties. Catherine expressed her desire to hear more from one of the women who accompanied her to her marriage. This close relationship can be seen in the Salon of Clement VII, where Salviati is pictured as being close to the bride and groom by her visual proximity to the couple and her inclusion amongst other dignitaries. In this letter from October 1534, Catherine asks for advice and aid in securing a pair of sleeves made from cloth of gold, which is very important at the time. In this, I found that she wished to display the craftsmanship of her home, share her heritage, and present herself as elegant, sophisticated, and very Florentine. However, even more important for the study of Catherine is the controversy surrounding the tone and then rhetoric of these letters. 
This rhetoric serves to illustrate whether Catherine's intentionality in her material display was truly intentional or just really happenstance, the writings of a girl in a foreign country. Historians such as Susan Brimhall, Leah L. Cheng, and Catherine Kong take a more balanced view to this perception of her. They assert that these letters paint a sympathetic depiction of the queen, colored by calculated political motives. Caroline Zum Kolk supports Catherine's thesis, stating that, and I quote again, Catherine's creative and practical control and the queen's power, status, and authority were constructed, constructed rhetorically as well as in the material artifacts themselves, end quote. The research done by both Broomhall and Kolk reveals a coordinated strategy of patronage and artistry grounded in a relational and feminine approach to court politics. Scholars seem to agree that these letters also reveal the level of control Catherine exercised on her materiality projects. Letters such as the one written to the court jeweler Francois de Jardin describe the exact arrangement of certain gemstones and demonstrate a strong intellectual knowledge of the field surrounding her creations. In her letter, she outlines the jewels that she wanted in a cap for her son-in-law, the Duke of Lorraine, and the instructions for a complex ring made of emeralds. The finished piece was then made to symbolize friendship amidst fragility, and the letter demonstrates Catherine's knowledge, as well as her detail, her attention to detail and symbolism. Her attention to detail in matters of jewelry and architecture extended to her clothing and her portraiture. Undoubtedly, Catherine would not have left behind her Italian influences when she arrived at the French court. Her actions to ensure the proper identity as queen and cultural patron can trickle outward and can be seen in the material depictions of her, even if they were commissioned by another or one of her social circle. So understanding some portraiture. So to better analyze the depictions of Catherine, I found it is important to understand some key shifts and trends in Italian portraiture, but with this, I will be brief. So these trends would have influenced the French portraiture styles that would later depict Catherine, as can be seen in the work of Germain Le Manier and Francois Clouet, both artists which I will be looking at later in the presentation. So representations of wealth and dignity came through the display of clothing, but also depictions of clothing through its representation of cloth, embroidery, and gems, and each of which could be imbued with meaning. This can be seen in Raphael's Giovanni of Aragon, as depicted here. The style represented here is meant to arrest the viewer's senses, both in sight and touch, through its depictions of ornamentation, cloth, softness, luminosity, richness, and its emphasis on texture. I would only wish I could blow it up for you so you guys could really see the detail of this. But this also falls into the tradition, tradition of state portraiture, which catered to court etiquette and fashions, showcased family colors, and worked to create a sense of awe and myth. Raphael in particular emphasized the clothes and jewels and found the peculiarities in features and blended those features with the rising idealized forms of oval faces, almond eyes, and plump sloping shoulders to create the perfect female form as you can see depicted here. To move more into some clothing styles, uh, state portraiture would of course have displayed the latest trends in dress. Dress was of particular significance to the Florentines due to a display culture prevalent at the time. This display culture was based in the practice of public and of vibrant manifestations of wealth. This culture formed a consciousness of dress based on the cost of fabric itself, and the high cost of fabric furthered the practice and understanding that the more fabric a person actually wore on their personage, the wealthier that they were. Adding to the overall cost of the garment was the fabric, the dyes, the practice of using human powered looms, hand stitching, ornamentation, and the tailoring needed to make a full garment. For example, to give you just a general idea of some price ranges, price could range from three florins per braccio for quality wool to 20 florins per braccio for sumptuous brocades, that's in the silk category. Thus, the splendid garment visually allowed Florentines to gain an understanding of the social status and honor of the wearer. This led to the fashion of layering and slashing sleeves, which showed off various layers and workmanship of the garment, as seen through 1500s portraiture, such as this portrait of Maria de Medici by Alessandra Allori, as well as for male costume, the portrait of Francesca I de Medici by an unknown artist. Ornamentation on bodices, particularly that of necklines, the waistlines, and the shoulders, allowed for personalization and demonstrate hierarchy. Later in the 16th and 17th century, it would be the designs and st 